able to turn it on in the next few minutes. But um, I'm joining you from Nairobi, Kenya, and I work with AWARD, African Women in Agricultural Research and Development. A warm welcome to all our participants. We are going to give you a few minutes for um, more participants to join us, and we should be ready to start in the next three minutes. In the meantime, I just want to let you know that the sessions are being recorded. Be aware that this session is being recorded uh, and um, including the chats. So even private chats that you do to each other will be uh, available uh, once the recording is done. So just be aware that the, the session is being recorded. We are also planning to, to tweet uh, the session discussions. So please tweet away, uh, cultivate equality, hashtag cultivate equality, hashtag gender in ag. So tweet away if you can, but we will be sharing some of the conversations that are happening here on Twitter and on other social media platforms. Um, and as we wait for other people to join us, please feel free to use the chat function, which is open. Tell us who you are, where you're joining us from, which country you're joining us from, and institution, if you may. So welcome, feel welcome, all of you. Okay, so it is 35 minutes afternoon here in Nairobi, and I am seeing participants streaming in and joining in, so we are ready to start. Thank you very much for joining us. Like I mentioned, my name is Doreen Odongo, and I work with AWARD, African Women in Agricultural Research and Development. We are excited to have you on this session uh, where we will be discussing how to enhance the contribution of gender research and how gender researchers can advance agricultural research and development. My job here today is to welcome you and to give you an overview of the program. And then I will be introducing the moderator whom I will hand over the program to. Uh, I mentioned that you can feel free to use the chat function. The chat box is open. Do tell us who you are. We want to know who is joining us and where they're joining us from please feel free to post in the chat um, your name and uh, your institution, if you may, and where you're joining the call from. So today's session is going to run for one and a half hours. We have four panelists whom the moderator is going to introduce to you. And we have an exciting program that will include uh, the participation of the audience as well. So please indulge us, do uh, respond to our questions once the moderator gets to you. And um, uh, the, the, the program is going to include a panel conversation among the four panelists that we have today, a moderated panel conversation, as well as some questions that we will be posting to the audience to share with us their experiences, their views, and their knowledge on the, the, the questions in, in discussion. And we will be doing this through Mentimeter. So please indulge us once we post the link here, do feel free to uh, respond to our questions. And um, we'll have two, two sets of questions for the audience through moderator, through the Mentimeter. 
as well as two sets of questions for the panel con conversation. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the second phase of questions for the panelists, we will have a moderated Q&A. And at that point, you can feel free to turn on your mic. Of course, it will be moderated and you can read, um, share, you know, um, share your question or post, um, post in, the, in the chat and we can direct your question to whoever you want to respond to and have that conversation with you. And then at the end of the Q&A, we will have a um, closing session where the moderator is going to invite the panelists again to just give their closing or their parting shot and she will give uh, uh, her concluding remarks as well as the vote of thanks. Thank you very much. Once again, the session is being recorded. Be aware that even your chats are, even your private chats will be visible to the conference organizers. Okay, and without further ado, I want to introduce Dr. Michelle Bochuahu. Michelle Bochuahu is the Deputy Director Programs at Award African Women in Agricultural Research for Development. And Michelle is our moderator for the day. So over to you, Michelle. Thank you, Doreen. Thank you so much for this introduction. And we want to keep time. So we're just going to start just now. So good morning and good afternoon to all of you from wherever you're joining us today. Uh, it's a great privilege for me to be here today at the 2021 Cultivating Equality Conference. It is my pleasure to moderate this session on uh, unlocking the potential of gender research and researchers so that we can really change the way we are looking at agricultural research and, and development. What we have for you today is a very interactive discussion about the opportunity to revisit the vital role that gender research and researchers themselves play in advancing agricultural development and the society as a whole. Gender, researchers have, gender research has not always been given the priority it deserves. We all know that. Yet we have seen over the years the benefit of documenting, of analyzing, of, or challenging things like uh, stereotypes, social norms, roles, and responsibility around what it means to be a woman or a man in society. Definitely, each and every one of us has seen things with different perspectives, especially when it comes to pursuing justice and equality for all. I'm joining this discussion today by four amazing women who are passionate champion of gender equality and of course have been promoting by all means gender research and better representation of gender researchers in our different organizations. Today we have in this panel, Nicoline Dehan, who is currently the director of the CGR Gender Platform. She's also a senior researcher with more than 15 years experience in gender, in rural livelihood, agriculture, and natural resource management. She's previously worked as the leader of the gender team at the International Livestock Research Institute. She's also worked um, with the CGR program on water, lands, and ecosystem, and with the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO. Nicoline holds a PhD in rural uh, development from the University of Missouri in Columbia, USA. My next panelist is Petra Ab Abdusalam Sagi, who is a professor of gender and rural development at the Department of uh, Agricultural Extension and Rural Development. Mm -hmm. This is at the Federal University of Agriculture in Abiyokuta, Nigeria. She holds a PhD in agricultural extension and rural development, and she specializes in gender studies. She is one of our proud 2009 award fellow, and she currently serves as the director of FUNAB Universal Cons Services Limited. She's also part of the award country chapter in Nigeria. I'm also pleased to welcome our third panelist, this is uh, Rosanne Diab, who is an atmospheric scientist, an emeritus professor in environmental science at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, and a fellow of the African Academy of Science. She is the director of Gender Insights 
and she's a, she serves uh, on international committees um, such as the International Ozone Com Commission and the Commission on Atmospheric Chemistry and Global Pollution. So Rosanne is a very active champion of gender in science, serving as co-chair of the Gender Advisory Panel in the Third World Academy of Science. And last but not least, we have our dear Titi Lope Fakoya, who is a social development scientist with over 20 years of international cons consulting experience in the design, management, and evaluation of development programs. She has worked with uh, different uh, organizations, government agencies, and uh, quite a big range of civil society organizations across Nigeria. She's done a, a bit of work on monitoring and evaluation in terms of uh, policy development and conducted social impact assessment, stakeholder engagement and gender analysis in Africa, the Middle East, the United Kingdom. She holds a master's degree in development administration and management from the Institute for Development Policy and Management at the University of Manchester. She's also fully certified to administer the Myers-Briggs type indicator. This is the MBTI personality assessment, as well as the Edward Bono 6 thinking heart course. So quite a very diverse panel that we have today. I really want to thank you all for accepting to share your experience on gender research and why it matters for agricultural research and development during this 2021 Cultivating Equality uh, Conference. We are all happy to have you here. And as we get ready to start this very important conversation, I would first like to invite our participant as they tell us from where they're joining to also uh, let us uh, hear about what they think about the current status of gender research. I'll invite Joanne if we can have the questions on the Mentimeter, the two questions that we have for you to start off, off is about the, the, the gender research itself. What, are, what is your opinion? Is gender research su sufficiently visible in different sectors, in particularly in agriculture? And the second thing we want to hear your views about is the kind of interventions that you think will actually make us think differently about gender research and even make it more relevant. I believe, Joanne, you have posted the question on the Mentimeter. Yes, the, the link is on the chat. Please respond. Yes, I have the link is on the chat, the link to the questions. Thank you, Joanne. As the participants start responding, let's see how it looks like. Can we get this, the first response, Joanne? I believe it's going to be updating automatically. Joanne, do we have uh, do we have the response? Yeah, I can see Nicoline is asking if we can get the screen up with the answers. Uh, there is the response are loading. We can start with the first question.
I still can't see for my screen, Joan. I believe we can start with the first question, then we can show the, the, the next one. But as we wait, I can see a few answers coming in. Freeman is saying that in my view, not sufficiently, but it's getting a lot of attention more recently than in the past. Yeah. What is the chat? What is the, the Mentimeter telling us? Mm -hmm. And Nicolini is saying that she also said something similar. So we are getting more and more, more and more momentum um, on gender research. We, we are seeing uh, not just us as researchers, but we believe the, the, the wider community is also seeing the value of the contribution that uh, uh, our research on gender brings. Maybe we can keep having some of the chat people posting on the chat as we wait for, for Joanne. A couple of few answers. We might have a technical issue um, with the Mentimeter. So if you can go on and post on the chat so that we see. But what I can say already is from the two answers that we, uh, the two contributions that we've had in the chat, it, it, it comes to all of us that, um, yeah, there is some momentum around um, doing more gender research. And we hope that this will continue to be the case in the, in the, coming, in the coming years. As we wait for Joanne to give us the results, and we hope that they will be they will be saying the same thing probably. I want to turn to to you, uh, Nicoline. And you have actually said that uh, what we are seeing now it's actually a lot of momentum around gender research. It seems like there is still a lot that we need to do, but uh, gender research is getting more visible, interesting. So from your experience. How attractive is gender research today as an area of specialization? And, and, and do you think that the field of gender research has really changed over the years? And, and what will be your projections for the future? Over to you. Thanks, Michelle. Um, on your first question of uh, whether gender research is an attractive area to work in, I think it is. I mean, I think we're, we're at the beginning of a lot of research areas, a lot of research uh, um, interest. Um, so I think there's so many, at some level, low hanging fruits to work on. Um, I think it's an amazing time. Um, there's more interest, there's more attention. Um, there's more chances to do much more things in depth. Um, how many people uh, have combined gender research and animal health vaccines, for instance? That's a whole area nobody's ever touched before. So I think there's a lot that can be done on gender and research, and I think a lot is changing. Um, I'm also a little bit worried that there's a lot of noise, um, but there's a lot of noise often and everybody's working on it but are we really getting the right research and are we getting the right funding for that? So I think that's important too, as we move forward, how can we actually build good research um, and make sure that it's seen as valid research as well? Because I think that's gonna be important in the future as we move forward as well. As to the changes, there have been huge changes. Uh, when I started um, working for the CGIR in 2000, in Nigeria, actually, so <laughs> nice to see you, Tita. And <laughs> Petra, I've been to uh, Abuja and up north and everything. 
gender was sort of on the side. It was never really seen as important. And then a huge investment from several uh, sides, uh, including FAO, who developed the state of food and agriculture on women, which really brought data to the front um, and started talking about how women were invisible and how we make the invisible visible. So that was around 2011 at the same time Hillary Clinton came in, also made a whole thing about, and so things have been starting to move. And I think now we're at a point where it can't be stopped anymore. Um, so I think that has changed a lot. And gender research has been very important in that, because often what we know about gender uh, issues is that they are emotive. Um, everybody has their own ideas. When I started in this business, often I would get some, you know, often older man come up to tell me, yes, and my wife or my daughter. So everybody has something in their lives that they bring. So that's why the research is so important, because we do need the data. We do need the evidence. And more and more, I think we need much more understanding of the theoretical backgrounds, because only if we ground it in that way, are we going to be sustainable in the long run? So I think things have changed, but we still have a long way to go as we move forward. So those would be my sort of thoughts on that. Thanks, Nicolene. And uh, I, I think these are some of the, the discussions we've been having. Can you all hear me? Okay. These are some of the discussions we've been having uh, being in this field of gender, where we are looking at um, not just uh, promoting gender research, but also walking the talk uh, in terms of the investments that have been made, in terms of the results, the outcomes, the impact that we can see on the ground. Uh, these are some of the things that help us to see that there is, a, there is some progress that is being made but also um, that the challenges are still there and we still need to continue to voice as much as possible uh, all issues around taking into account gender equality in the, in the development arena. I'm now turning to you, Titi Lope. As you look at the challenges and opportunities for agricultural research and development in different continents, you have worked in different places, but you being based in Africa, do you think gender research is adequately recognized as a fundamental component of the agricultural transformation agenda? And if you think yes, uh, what effect has gender research made in shaping agricultural driven development? Thank you, Michelle. Um, I like the way you framed the question, if you think yes. <laughs> I was thinking, what if I think no? <laughs> But um, my starting point would be that uh, the need for gender research within the ARD space is not up for debate. And so much has been said, you know, that is not what we're here to, to discuss because countries are increasingly recognizing the connection between gender bias, economic growth and security. So that's, we know, you know, it's very hard nowadays for politics to ignore gender issues. But that is still at some kind of surface level. So the understanding exists. And I think your question is actually directed at fundamentally, you know, fundamentally, have we got there yet? And I think, no, we are not there yet, as many people have said, you know, in the chat box. I think that countries need to be made to recognize that they are hemorrhaging without uh, considering women. And this is the key. Research has to change its language to make countries see their loss and begin to talk in a, in a kind of way that makes it very apparent that you cannot go forward. You can only go thus far if you continue business as usual. So this framing will better incentivize the policymakers such that they begin to you know, allocate natural resources towards um, gender equity. So for me, I think that, yes, surface level approaches are accepted and recognized, but it's tick box. We need more complex and specific enough you know, research to address the real issues. <clears throat> and that is the crux of the matter. In making it fundamental, it has to go beyond allocation of resources and all of that. And it has to take more holistic examination of gender norms, gender rules, power dynamics, intersectionality, and so on and so forth. That is that about um, fundamental. So I think no, not yet. 
as far as the effects on gender in research, as far as the effect it has had in um, shaping agri development, I think quite a lot has been done, yes, but a lot more has to be done. Uh, gender research has enabled women to engage in agricultural value chains to an extent that have not been previously seen. And I think the previous um, speaker mentioned this, you know, through training and, and just research, there's so much more knowledge. And it's helping the women now to, um, women and men actually, to attract higher prices in the market for their goods. And I give the example of the work I did with Propcom, Propcom Makrafi, a gender program, um, an agri program in Nigeria where women were taught to parboil their rice and thereby increase the value and get more money for it on the value chain. And um, the field results were very, very encouraging when we went to speak with the women that, you know, uh, this is what you can do to get some more money. They were very happy. What am I saying? Gender research has um, worked to uh, enable women along the value chains and also in accessing small loans and further imputes and all of that. That is good because we know that typically, well, in many countries, mine, I'll take mine as an example, women are assigned less fertile plots than men and they have less access to resources and all of that. So with more research, we now understand the nuances of this and we can address, uh, we can differentiate, you know, there's a lot of gender differentiation and uh, disaggregation along that. I want to quickly tell the story here, which I think many of us will be familiar with about um, <coughs> Malawi pigeon peas. I have very short time left. It's a skit that we have developed, uh, we use for training in where we talk about uh, gender in agri. Um, and what happened in that situation, true story, I promise, true story, <laughs> researchers developed improved varieties of pigeon peas, you know, breeders, and based, of course, based on the market desired traits. So breeders had done a good job and they'd done what they thought was really good. But horror of horrors, the peas had zero levels of adoption, zero, zero, zero. And then they found that, that you know, instead, there was a local breed that had dominated 80% of the planting area. Why? Because in Malawi, women are responsible for production, harvesting, sale of peas, and so on <coughs> and so forth. And the breeders had forgotten to consult them. So that is what happens when you do not involve um, gender research adequately. You know, the unnuanced gender approaches can, it can exacerbate inequalities. It can re-entrench forms of violence, marginalize women in new ways, and you know, so it just it can make things worse. In summary, what am I saying? Gender research is valuable, yes. It has done beautiful things in the past, yes, and there is so much more to, uh, ahead of us to engage with. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Titi. I, I was worried at some point, but you're finishing with a note of optimism. I think you're just following the same line as, um, as, as, as Nicoline, but probably saying it it's a, in a bit different way, where you are kind of being, bringing also that other level of, of consciousness, but the need to really open up to the audience that we are targeting. Who are we looking into? Who are we engaging in this process of doing research, gender research, and what kind of context are we also uh, looking at in terms of what the results we want to see uh, on the ground um, in the different countries where we see uh, this gender research being done, but sometimes not getting the, the, the result that we, we want. You've talked about the zero adoption in, in that particular case of, of Malawi, I don't think it's because they didn't want to do their work well. It's probably the way it has been designed. So uh, what I'm hearing from you is how we think um, our stakeholder engagement in the gender research we do, but also how we think about the priorities the, and the needs on the ground when we are bringing this research close to those who, close to where we have um, the gaps on the on the ground. So thank you so much. And I think it's in the same line that uh, Roseanne 
will also join us now and talk about um, the progress that has been made in demonstrating the importance of applying a gender lens in agricultural research and development. There's been a pledge to work to make gender research become a very important priority uh, on the agricultural transformation agenda. Do you think there is something that has happened or to what extent have we really progressed? Rosanne? Thanks very much for, for that question. So, yeah, I think I find myself much in agreement with our, our previous speakers. And, um, you know, perhaps I could focus on the application of a gender lens, because I think um, Titi really ended with a, a case study emphasizing how important it is to take account of the, the views and perspectives of, of women. Um, particularly in agriculture. And I think um, the, the organization that I belong to, Gender Insight, is really aimed at promoting the application of a gender lens, which essentially means just that, taking account of the differences and perspectives and experiences um, of men and women. So I think perhaps what I would like to emphasize is that we must, when we're doing gender research, and we are applying a gender lens. It's not just to taking account of the needs of women, but looking at, at the different differences and needs of both men and women. And, and if we do that, I think we're going to get better, income, better outcomes. Certainly we'll have a better understanding of the differential impacts. And ultimately this is going to lead to um, more sustainable and um, longer term solutions um, in agricultural research. So I think we've moved beyond um, why it's important to apply a gender lens. Um, I think we're aware of the need. I think what we're grappling with at the moment is how to actually um, to go about this, how to make that difference on the ground. Um, and I think that definitely will be something that I can address in this, the second part of the question, how we can go about gender transformation. Um, and then perhaps I could just end with a, also a quick um, anecdote about the importance of, of applying, applying a gender lens. It was um, one in, in, in my country, South Africa, in the northern part near the, the border with Zimbabwe, where one of the greatest needs that was identified was to bring a water supply um, to the people who were engaging in agriculture. And so um, the developers went in and they implemented this water supply, bringing the water up to stand pipes that were close to where the people were working, far away from the river, because traditionally what had been happening is the women would go down to the river to collect the water. And they found that this um, innovation was, um, it was destroyed. The stand pipes were destroyed um, and they couldn't understand why. And it was only when they started investigating what were the perspectives of the young men and women in, in this area that they discovered it was the young men in the area who were destroying these stand pipes deliberately because um, when the women went down to the river in the early evening to collect the water, that was where all the young men gathered to meet all the girls. And, and so they, they completely sabotaged um, this uh, development. So perhaps just end on that note and emphasize the importance of taking in the views of both men and women. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, Rosanne. And, and I think we have also had this same story, but the other way around, where women were actually not very happy to have these uh, water points near to their places because the only option for them to really chat with the women were when they went to the, to the river. So uh, you've just brought another part of it and definitely the need to contextualize but also to think very carefully about who is our target audience once, once more. Uh, and again, this whole aspect of what exactly is our research, gender research doing to achieve what kind of outcomes, what kind of outputs. 
So I, I believe you're just surfing in the same vibe as uh, Nicoline and, um, and, uh, and, and Titi. Let's see what Petra thinks. Maybe she might be looking at things differently. Petra, on the visibility of gender researchers and gender research and actions to make this profession more attractive, a, a lot has been said about really mentoring researchers uh, using mentoring as an effective tool for directing and inspiring. I'm looking at you because I know you've been really um, a champion of uh, institutional mentoring at FUNAB. What do you think is the role of mentoring in, cre in creating a critical mass of gender researchers? And how can we institutionalize mentoring? How does um, an effective mentoring program look like? We really want to hear about the FUNAB experience that you were uh, spearheading. Thank you very much, Michelle, for the, you know, the questions that you have asked. Um, mentoring is very critical for institutions. Uh, before I continue to tell you about the role of mentoring, I, I think I need to talk a bit about mentoring in research institutions. Mentoring is a, a system of a self, uh, like, like a kind of a semi-structured guidance, whereby a, a senior researcher or scientist share their knowledge, skills, and experience selflessly to assist others who would be mentee uh, to uh, progress in their own lives, in their careers, and even in their research. It can be short term, it can be long term, depending on the set goal of uh, such a gender responsive mentoring. Uh, it's about motivating others, it's about, it's about um, giving others the lubrication to, to, to move ahead selflessly without even getting you know, any, any, any money uh, from it. So it's about uh, empowering young gender researchers to be gender responsive. It's about being non-biased. It's about having listening hair, as and uh, it's about being compassionate. So the, the let me now go into the role of mentoring in gender research. Um, if uh, mentoring is inculcated into the into the uh, culture of a, of a system of an institution, uh, it will allow a researcher to have opportunities for agricultural researchers and organizations to investigate thoroughly the underlining and unseen causes of uh, uh, gender gaps in agriculture. Uh, gender responsive research also is a key actor of uh, driving transformative uh, change in African agriculture through approaches that challenge uh, orthodoxies and uh, uh, ensure that uh, we have sustainability and prosperity in, in Africa. So um, again, um, it enables the researcher to develop robust understanding of how gender relations affect the ways uh, in which research is conducted and even the uptake of technology. Because if, if, we, if researchers, they are just uh, into their research without considering uh, uh, mentoring, uh, where people will be able to be exposed to uh, serious mentoring in, in, in gender research. The output of their research is just, uh, nobody will want to take it up. Just like my this other speakers, they have, they have also highlighted, it will just end up in the shelf and uh, there will not be uptake, there, there, there will not be adoption of, of such a technology of, of, of such a research. And then it also opens up the potentials to maximize the efficiency and the effectiveness of uh, uh, gender research by saving time, you save time, you save your energy, you also save uh, 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 resources, because by then you know where to, where your research is being focused and where to, where, who, who is going to take up the, the benefit of the research, who is going to benefit from the deliverables and even the implementation of, uh, of, of the research. And because of this, it leads to, you know, increasing the scope of the research itself and then the scale and sustainability of uh, the impact. In institutions, um, it has the potential to effectively organize, you know, change interventions even within the institutions. In particular, even when men are involved in mentoring, 
uh, they are they, they kind of have a kind of a change in their mindset towards gender gender research. So it's, it's a win-win situation for for uh, mentoring to be to, to be you know the role of mentoring in institution. It assists the academics and practitioners who conceive gender responsive research as a core element in an effective organization change intervention. You know, uh, a focus on, on what needs to change in the dominant organization culture, practice and values can lead to key players in the organization becoming actively involved uh, in the needed, needed process. And this will esteem, you know, how or the depth of the, the gender uh, research. And how can we institutionalize mentoring as a fundamental? Um, institutions and their management must make it deliberate. It's, it's good, it's, it's like a deliberate, uh, a conscious effort. Uh, uh, they should be committed, uh, more accountable, and they, they should be motivated and they have strong desire to institutionalize gender research and mentoring in, in a new creative way. And uh, uh, they should not see gender mentoring in, in, in institutions as uh, uh, a, a short-lived administrative statement, uh, whereby uh, uh, if, 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 if such is the case, if it's, it's like that, such programs can fizzle out, can die before it gets started, if, they are, if the management is not committed, or if it's just like a political statement or administrative statement, rather than implanting into the researcher an academic culture of the institution with a clear path for growth, sustenance, and uh, prosperity. So I think for institutions in Africa to include mentoring in gender research into their uh, curriculum, I think it's a win-win situation for the researchers and for the institutions because it, it builds a, a kind of uh, leadership pipeline for, for, for the institutions, for Africa as a nation, for even uh, scientists too. So it's, it's like a leadership pipeline will be established and uh, everybody will you know, be able to understand what mentoring in gender research is all about. Because without mentoring, I've also benefited for, from mentoring I must tell you, uh, I was I I am a fellow of uh, award 2009, 2009, and uh, I was opportunity to be given a, a senior mentor in gender research who really helped me to grow. I thought before I met her, I thought I knew a lot of issues. I I could solve a lot of things by myself. Not until she started exposing me to you know how things are done when you want to. Well, consider gender in, in, in research. And what, actually now, what is going on even in Funabia now? When you take, uh, you mentor people in gender research, it's like a kind of eureka thing, like, oh, so this is it. So I can, I can balance the story like this. So I'm not one-sided anymore. So it's like, oh, so I can do it like this. Even as, a, I don't know, as core scientists, you know, people are now looking at it as, a, like oh this is so this is this is so beautiful I can do it this way so it's, it's, it's a win-win situation if we have mentoring in gender research and it is what is in demand right now even as gender specialists the gender specialists we also need mentoring we also need more mentoring in gender research thank you thank you Petra thank you so much Petra. What I'm, I'm getting from your, your talk is um, we need to be intentional. We are all working in research institutions. We're not just sending our research out there. We need to be in, intentional in how we want to guide them in that process of making their profession more attractive uh, and also uh, kind of packaging the, 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 the results, the achievements, the milestones that uh, they, they, they can get for their continuous efforts uh, to show what gender research can bring to, the, to their communities, to the society. So I, I believe bringing that part of the institution contributing, not just to say that we have some gender re researchers, but also putting uh, the necessary means 
uh, for gender researchers to be mentored, for gender research to get capacity building initiative and other uh, aspects of building their own careers as uh, researchers who are contributing to the overall research um, department in our institution, working very closely with other disciplines. And I want to just ask, um, Joanne, do we have the results now? Because I want at this point to probably engage now the, 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 the participants on the, we have now talked about the need to have gender research. We have seen that the response is definitely yes, we need to continue to advocate, to be the advocate of more gender research. I think the question that has been posed here is how do we do that? What are the strategies that we need to put in place? What are the possible options that will help us really promote gender researchers and the research that they do? Do we have the response to the first? To the first, or can we go to the can we go to the to the next round, Joanne? Uh, let's what see. I will do, what I will do as as you you try and fix this is just to pose the question. Can we have the question on the chat, and the the participant can be responding responding directly on the chat. Maybe that will help us save some time. And if at the end we get the, 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 the Mentimeter, we can still do. So please, can you post the question on the chat? The questions that we have for you are on the, the, the difference. Do, do gender researchers really make a difference, a substantial difference when we look at it from a multidisciplinary point of view? And we look at that specific profession and we look at the other researchers do we really see a substantial difference being made by the gender researchers? And if we are able to answer yes, how can we then continue to advance the field of gender research uh, in agricultural research and development? And what do you see as being some of the bottlenecks for the researchers today? Why are they not able to really do their work the way they would have wanted to do it? What are those challenges that we can air of here today? And I believe you can be posting your answer on the chat. You can respond to any of the three questions. And as the, 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 the answers come um, to the chat, maybe I'll turn to my panelists and, and start with you, um, Titi. You've said it, we still need to do a lot. Um, there are still some good strategy that we need to explore. We need to revisit um, our way of thinking uh, about gender research. Uh, what do you think we need to we need to look at when we are designing um, effective program to enhance the capacity of gender scientists so that they can actually influence agricultural research and development? Titi. Michelle, Titi dropped off. So okay. Can keep and come back to her. Okay. So. Okay, fine. So we as we wait Rosanne. for, yeah, as we wait for Titi to to come back to us, Rosanne, you had alluded to some of the strategy as you were talking and 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 presenting the needs for us to bring both women and men on board. What do you think we need to do to really amplify our campaign, our voices around applying a gender lens to research? You've said it, it's not just about that gender lens, but it's the how we want to do that. So what do you think the how should be so that we can actually have or see more sustainable outcomes in agricultural de uh, driven development? 
Okay, so, so two points I want to make. Um, one relates to what I've just posted in the chat, um, which said that perhaps we need to start moving beyond research and thinking about um, gendered innovation. I think there's a huge need for um, taking account of the gender lens and in innovation in the field of agriculture. Um, and there's not been that much done about that. So I think if you look at it in comparison to what we know about gendered research, it's, it's really lacking. So I would like to emphasize that's something that we need to start addressing um, the innovation cycle and what can be done to get agricultural innovations that take account of the needs of, of both men and women. And then the second point I want to make is that I think we need to um, move from being gender sensitive to being gender transformative. I think we're doing pretty well in the gender sensitive realm. We're, we're aware of the needs of women um, and we're collecting gender disaggregated data in, in many cases. Um, gender, gender research is, is up and coming. But if we want to be truly gender transformative, then I think we need to, to move beyond just being aware. We need to start addressing the imbalances in power and privilege between men and women. This is absolutely critical. Um, we're not going to get equal participation of men and women. We're not going to get gender equality or gender equity until we start addressing these power imbalances between men and women. Um, women must have equal opportunities to be the decision makers. They must have um, access to resources. We must address um, many of the, thing, the things like unconscious bias that are held. Um, so it goes beyond just addressing the, the needs and aspirations of women, but trying to be um, gender transformative so that women have greater agency um, and greater control over resources. So those are the two points I, I would like to make and conclude on. Thanks. Indeed, Rosanne, and I can see uh, people agreeing with you on the chat. We really need to work on the agency we need to work on making sure that uh, the opportunities are well are distributed among women and men. And Sarah is saying here that um, she's looking at the gender studies in innovation and gender transformative approaches as things that we need to consider very, um, uh, uh, things that really need to speak to each other if we want to see some change in the, in the society. So very well interlinked. And I can see um, Nicolene has also said something about scientists, uh, gender scientists, I believe, um, working intentionally with others to ensure that it's not just about developing um, the technologies or putting in place some interventions, but also making sure that these are responding to some specific uh, uh, needs and that when they develop um, these technologies, be available to women, not only, but also all the other disadvantaged groups, and ensure that the technical scientists listen to women, listen to women, design for them. And I want to add to that, just as Rosan has said, listen to the community. I believe it's something very critical that we all, we all have to do. The community itself and how each and everyone um, can be accommodated according to, to the needs. Let me turn to Petra in this same line of discussions. What do you think are the opportunities to improve the visibility of gender research? Over to you, Petra. Thank you, Micheline. Uh, opportunity abounds for uh, gender research. Look at what we are doing presently. It's one opportunity whereby we sit down and discuss about uh, gender issues in research, even among stakeholders. Um, another thing is to also prioritize uh, gender and diversity at the workplace and in overall research process. 
even from the design to the implementation and then to the deliverable of, of such a project. There's also the you know, opportunity also abounds in, you know, as we are seated, we are discussing now, um, we can share, you know, outcome of this discussion on, on different fora, different symposia, we can organize symposium, different symposia, uh, conferences, um, we can publicize gender research using different media. Uh, people can also come up to spearhead gender research uh, projects. We can also consider engaging audiences, several stakeholders seeking to generate interest. We can also pursue strong advocacy uh, to inform discussions, to draw participation into programs, also, also engage allies, uh, both in public and, uh, and uh, private sector. Uh, in governance, even in policy uh, making. We can also look at a way of um, uh, establishing or making, uh, creating websites of, of professionals. Um, we can also form networks of uh, researchers uh, of like mind and even, even on like minds, because if you have both like minds and on like minds in, 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 in a, uh, a network, it's, it makes everything very interesting. So um, use those tools, media tools, uh, we can do that. Uh, we also know that even uh, mostly, most of the decisions taken even in research, the deliverables at the end of the day, hands up with the policymakers. There's a way we can go about it because the policymakers will not read the bulk of whatever we, we we want to we want to let them know if we, if we are able to make it very short and you know uh, the deliverables the the outcome of, of our research to so that when they are discussing at the governance level that they will be able to at you know at a glance make it more pictorial uh, a kind of pictorial representation of if they look at it once like they, they, they you know they already understand what. Uh, gender research is all about. Uh, then we can also look at different communication efforts, targeting different audiences. Uh, we can share information, resources, materials, uh, and uh, again, we can periodically we can we can do a series of monitoring, learning, and evaluation, even among gender researchers, so that we will know if uh, truly. Uh, a lot of changes are taking place. And if they are not taking place, we need to go back to the drawing board to see what needs to be done. Um, uh, we, we should not make some of these goals a rocket science. Let me, let, me, let me say this. In African setting, a man has been promoted to be the king. And is, 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 we are living in a patriarchal society. And because of that, any intervention that we, we, we are bringing in as gender specialists, we must also incorporate the, 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 the men folk into it so that there will be a buy-in by, if they, if they are able to buy in some of this research, honestly, we will have smooth sale. Actually, when we showcase the fact that their daughters, they are going to benefit maximally, their wives will benefit, and that even they, themselves will benefit. So they, they will act as our advocates, advocates for women in, in empowerment. So um, with all that, because of the upbringing of, 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 of men in Africa, any, any project, any research project that does not incorporate or does not include them, will seem as if uh, it's, a, it's a sheer waste of time. But as it is now, this conference and so many other conferences, these are opportunities to showcase gender uh, research, to showcase the feasibility of, uh, of, of gender research. Thank you, Petra. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm hearing that uh, we, we, we should not just be working with the convinced. We actually have a lot of work to do to bring on board 
others who are not yet seeing the benefit of doing gender research and the benefit of research, gender research for all. So definitely you've mentioned about the, the, the leadership, the decision makers, and I think Adeline here is very much in, in, in agreement with you as she's talking about the political will in research and uh, the fact that this is another critical point that we need to consider. Most of the time we have, we all have in our institutions, gender policies, strategies, they are so well written, but when it comes to implement, when it comes to poor resources to actually see what can be done on, on the ground, we, we, left, we, we are there left with no opportunity to show what the gender research can, 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 can bring to our communities. So definitely we need to walk the talk. We need to bring more of the non-convinced and uh, help them to see the value of uh, the gender research we do and all the people who are actually carrying uh, that research. And, and for this, we need to see some level of change because this is what will also kind of bring that momentum for others to see that there is something that they are missing. And, and I want to turn to you, Nicoline. What do you think can be those critical changes that we need to make to effectively project ourselves in the future of gender research? Uh, not a small question, <laughs> if I may say so. Um, I think there's several parts to it, and um, I'm going to talk about four, uh, although I'll be honest, this is not uh, exclusive. Um, one of the areas I think we do need is we need more in-depth research. Partly I say that because I think a lot of research now often talks about how women are overburdened, et cetera, et cetera, and puts often women in a victim position. And I don't think we're going to get very far with that argument in the long run. Um, so we need more in depth and really try to understand. The other number two would be for me, we need more men. Um, often, and you will even see it on this call, we have a few coming up, but we need more men researchers as well, and we need to engage more men in this whole conversation. I think that, it, that, that will be vital. Then, for me, very important, and, and why I, I really appreciate working with Award, for instance, is we need more researchers. We need new, a new generation of gender researchers. We need new people to bring in new ideas, new thoughts. How do we move this forward? And it's difficult, partly because gender research in agriculture is often, you know, not the nicest place to be because often gender or agriculture is often quite conservative. Agriculture is often seen very much about productivity. Everything else is on the side. So we need to change mindsets. We need to shift the mindset and, and figure out how we can actually make gender researchers uh, an important part of that conversation. We're working on it. This conference is one way of doing it. But often, like was already mentioned, we're speaking to the converted here. Uh, how do we reach out to the rest? And I do think we need new voices in that. I, I think we really need to build a new uh, group of gender researchers, partly because what I've seen is once you get them at the, you know, at, the, at the incoming level in an organization, they assume it's normal. And they present that to the rest of the world that it's normal. It's not something different. We just need to do it. Let's get on and do it. So I really like that energy and I want to use that energy. And I think we need to support that energy. Having said that, or in line with that, one of my dreams is still that we develop certain centers of excellence in gender research across Africa and Asia. I think we really need to get a pipeline going um, in uh, these, these continents. We need to move that agenda forward. It shouldn't only always be from one side to the other. We need to really build that expertise inside uh, uh, the continents. And so that's one of my dreams still, if we can figure out how we could actually do that as, as we move forward. I think with some of those four things, a combination of them, we will change things, but we do need to change it. And I think some of the questions uh, on, the, on the chat, including Ida's chat question, how are we gonna break some of the patriarchy? I agree, it's not easy. And it requires all of us to show up every time, every time and to, in the end, also get some of the gray hairs, being there in those conversations with those people to make sure we make a difference. Um, so yeah, I think we can. I mean, it's not impossible, but it requires all of us to work together.
Thank you, Nicoline. And how I like your, your recommendation or your suggestion on the center of excellence. I, I believe if we can really think about gender research as something that is really central to our research systems, I, I believe that we would achieve a lot not just to, to, to make the contributions of women more visible, but definitely, as you're saying, that is where we're also going to push more men to see the value of this research and probably to engage uh, in, 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 in this research um, uh, through the, 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 the center of excellence. I believe this is one thing that we are missing a lot um, but we have an opportunity to do so because we have so many center of excellences uh, across the continent, across the world. I don't even think that it's about having one uh, being somewhere else, but it can actually be integrated in what we already have. Because at the end of the day, what we are trying to say here is gender research is an integral part it's definitely an integral part of the research that we do because we do research to respond to the problems of the society, not for it to be on the shelf. So I definitely like your ideas and I believe these are very great insight of how we can make this work. And probably we can go to the chat, Doreen, what do we have as questions for our panelists? Okay, so there's a question from Comfort, and this is to Nicoline. Nicoline said we need good research, uh, to which I agree. What areas should we be paying attention to? What questions should we be asking? That is a question that is addressed to Nicoline. So I'll read the questions. Should I read all like five questions and then we give uh, the panel an opportunity to answer before we go to the rest, Michelle? I believe so, we can do that. Okay, okay. All right, and then the second question again from Comfort is directed to Petra. Can you share with us some opportunities to receive mentoring? I know of award, are there others? All right, then the second, the third question is from Sarah, Christine. In Africa, the organizations that support female and youth innovators are very diverse. Informal sectors are also key. What is your opinion? Do they know what type of support women and youth really need? It was not directed to any specific panelists. So Michelle, I don't know who, whom we are going to address that one, to direct that one to. Maybe it's about, to Rosal. Okay, all right. And then uh, there's a question from Ida. Again, uh, Ida didn't specify who, uh, to, to whom the question is addressed. What has been done is being done or should be done to challenge and transform patriarchal structures cultures and norms at the level of research and development institutions, which can be a major ob obstacle for gender research and such as, such as those of the CGR, uh, the NAS and beyond. So Ida wants to know what has been done or should be done to challenge and transform patriarchal structures, cultures and norms at the institutional level. Yeah, so and I can take this for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think Nicoline had actually touched on the patriarchal systems, and maybe if any one of you will want to add, let's start with Nicoline. Should I start with uh, the first question, or should I start with um, the one about the patriarchy? <laughs> As you like, because you, you actually finished your, your, thoughts, your thoughts with the patriarchal system, so maybe you can take it from there. <laughs> One of the other thoughts about the patriarchal system is I think, and this is not always easy, but I think we need to make sure that we are actually already at the beginning of where we're talking about the research challenge, the research question, um, in the sense that if we are involved in the beginning of the conversation, we move the whole conversation forward um, instead of being added on at the end. And then it's more about what we're trying to do with everything and that in that process, bring everybody along. So what I often argue in research projects is, what is your real challenge that you're looking at? And what's the real gender issue in that? Because once you have that, then the whole research project will help you solve it. And it's not directly cha challenging the patriarchy, but it's having a vision together more of where we wanna go. Um, and I think that's important where we do have women's voice in that from the beginning. On the question about the research, um, I would see three areas. 
gender transformative approaches, I think there's a lot of research that needs to be done. Otherwise, it becomes another one of those, uh, how do you call it, uh, trendy words and trendy ways of doing it, but understanding really what it means and, and really working with people on, on making sure it really happens and not just a tick off as well, because we are in danger of ha that happening. Decision making, I think that's, again, one of those areas that we don't know enough. COVID proved it. Um, I always use the example of COVID. Um, probably if we had more women in decision making in the beginning, maybe all the schools wouldn't have been closed that fast um, because women understand the implications of it. Um, so how do we make sure that women actually are in that decision making? How do we give them a bigger voice and all of that? And last but not least, and I know I'm, I'm, I'm probably not uh, the only one saying that, but I do think climate change. If we want to be at, at the front of that, why don't we make sure that women actually get the technologies and the opportunities and, 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 and the approaches to get good technologies, et cetera, to deal with climate change? Why should they be at the end of the, of the, of the line? Let's put them up front and figure out how we can deal with climate change since that is something that's affecting all of us. So those would be the sort of the three areas I think that we do, we do need to work more in, in the research space. Thank you, Nicoline. We go to you, Petra about other uh, possibilities of uh, for mentoring beyond awards? Thank you, Michelle. Um, there are many opportunities for, for mentoring gender research. Um, it's just that a lot of people, they are not looking you know, at some of the opportunities. Um, well, the other the person asking had already talked about award and what award is doing. Um, again, uh, award also has a, a program called uh, Gender Responsive in Agricultural Research and uh, Development. Um, this uh, opportunity is given to eight African institutions. And uh, there are a lot of testimonies you know, going on about, about the project itself. Um, I wish gender researchers will also look at possibilities of, you know, th there are so many opportunities sponsored by, by, by uh, some other projects, uh, even on the internet, uh, I, I can I can relate with it with this because even uh, at a nine world level, the uh, Nigerian uh, chapter of um, of award of award that uh, the fellows Nigerian fellows had you know put together, um, most of whom we do you know post a lot of opportunities for mentoring, but a lot of people they are not even picking up those opportunities. I don't know why this is so. Um, because it, it takes a lot to put in mentoring uh, you know, activities, but if you have programs for mentoring and people are not really taking up the opportunities, I don't think it will, it will work. So there are out there, there are a lot of opportunities for mentoring, even in other you know, institutions. We, you, we, we need to locate the focal points, people who are gender, savvy who are not just because they are women but because they know and they can interpret what gender uh, issues is all about so we need to look at them we need to, we need to work with them we need to you know harmonize our research with with, with the thinking of, of you know uh, having a gender responsive research and then for challenging patriarchal society uh, we can't keep quiet we, we continue to talk about it uh, not that, that we want to antagonize anyone, uh, because uh, when it comes to, to norms and, and culture, we need to be very careful about how we go about issues. But then, even in a patriarchal society, we need to locate champions and the advocates of, of, uh, of uh, uh, women plight that uh, will be able to look at issues from a, a gender lens and that uh, will be able to champion the, you know, the course of uh, uh, you know, incorporating gender into, into norms, into culture, because we need to be very careful with what we do. 
Um, again, it, it also starts from, from the, even the, the family also. The, the family, uh, it, it's not necessarily that uh, it has to be uh, global all of a sudden. It's, 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 it's like a kind of um, uh, steps that we need to take. We are still trying to toddle about it. So we need to take, we need to start taking giant steps now and challenging, uh, subtly challenging uh, orthodoxies. Thank you. Thank you, Petra, and, and thank you for bringing again the whole aspect of uh, mentoring. I, I think at the world we are very proud of our mentoring model that has really evolved over the years and which is really looking at um, different steps and different level of development where we are not just thinking about who is the mid-career uh, researcher or uh, researcher today, but we're also thinking about the next generation. And we are also looking back at those who have actually made their steps and uh, gotten there to actually see what we can learn from the past, the challenges, what this past can bring to the present and how we use the present of uh, now the mid-career gender scientists to inspire the next generation. I believe when we work with that, um, without model, we definitely going to be continue to push for more gender researchers in, 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 this, fair, in this field in, in the coming years. But I do believe that it's not just about a word. There are also a couple of other models coming up uh, out there. Um, we have the Mazawo Institute, Mawazo Institute that has put um, together a fellowship program that also has a strong component on, uh, on mentoring with now a, a, a quite different um, model, but still about how do we guide to ensure that we can actually build our uh, career development as scientists, but also in other professions. And you also have a couple of other initiatives uh, being led by AGRA. They have a new program on, on leadership and, and mentoring and a couple of others that are working in the same, in the same field. I think we all coming together to complement each other, depending on the approach that we are taking. And one thing that we do at, at the word, maybe to finish with this, is also to give that opportunity that what has been learned can be transfer without us being there. Uh, and that's what we are doing with our institutional mentoring program, like working with Petra. I mean, they are actually now doing their mentoring program alone. We're, not yet, we're no longer there, but it's something that has become part of the institution and that they're working um, towards to continue to perpetuate in the coming years. And we've done the same with uh, CSIR in Ghana, and we hope to continue to support different institutions in that direction. Let me turn to, to Rosanne, and I'm very conscious of time. Doreen, I don't know if we have more questions, but I will want to just get a few words from Rosanne. We don't have any more questions on the chat. Okay. Go ahead, so, so there's no specific question for me to address. So perhaps I can pose a question of my own, and <laughs> it's, it's open to anybody who who wants to to address it. It's something that's always worried me when we talk about mentoring for women. How do we overcome the potential stigma attached to this? That somehow there's something wrong with the women, and they need to be um, sorted out. They need to be mentored. And I think it brings me back to the point that I made previously, that perhaps it's more important for us to involve the men in this, this conversation than, than anybody else, because only then will we address all the problems and challenges that, we, that we're facing. So it's not a criticism, it's a, it's a concern about whether other people have also experienced that, that somehow we need to fix these women and mentor them and make them change rather than systemic changes. It's open for anybody to address. Thanks, Rosanne, and that's the beauty of this. <laughs> I, I think your, your point is very valid and, and we do share it. I, I believe we are also in the same questioning at the world 
And as we are talking about the institutional mentoring, uh, working with Petra, maybe she would want to say a few words. It's not just about women this time around. It's actually about men and women in this mentoring program, because we've also realized that we cannot be fixing women. We actually need to look at the overall context, the enabling environment, and this cannot happen if we are not uh, engaging more women in this process. So let me probably have this as the parting shot and ask Nicoline to say what she thinks about this in one or two minutes, then we go to Petra. And then we see if Rosanne is convinced and she can also give us her concluding remark on this in one or two minutes. Over to you, Nicoline. I think like with everything in gender, you need different approaches. So I think I agree completely. We need to get men more on board. We've now shown how important women are, but now let's also uh, include men in that conversation. I think, again, one of my parting shots still is, let's make sure we can develop the new generation of gender researchers. Uh, we need those, otherwise we won't move it forward. And I think that's the most important part uh, as we move forward. So that's my parting shot. Let's hope we can develop the new gen, uh, generation of gender researchers and as the platform, as the gender platform, we're willing to help and, and make sure that happens. Thank you, Nicoline. Petra, in one minute, okay. what can uh, you say? <laughs> uh, I, I want to tell uh, Roseanne that uh, I, I was given a, a man to, to be, to, you know, as my mentor. Uh, in fact, I was the one who fixed him at the, at the, at the long run because, <laughs> because he was really exposed to a lot of, a lot of things, a lot of uh, uh, gender issues that he never knew could uh, you know, impede uh, success for, for women. And um, I must tell you now that even the man is uh, the president of uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the president, the, the chairperson steering committee of Howard, as, as we are talking now, and he's really making a lot of, a lot of um, room for, for more women researchers, more men researchers to, to grow. So it depends on the, the, the rules of the game. We need to set the, the you know, rules and regulations whereby people's opinion, your mentee's opinion, your own opinion as a mentor is well respected and um, you use a lot of your resources effectively. You manage situations because if there are no ground rules, you, you, you know, you, you will be going against what uh, the aim of mentoring is all about. So on the last note, I process, um, mentoring is, is, is a continuum, is a process that uh, even we as we are seated as panelists, we need to, to continue to, to, you know, to do. And we also need to mentor, to continue to mentor other people to be more dynamic enough to understand different domains of you know, social interactions that we assist them to tailor their research and to, you know, uh, more inclusive, more representative, and more transformative uh, uh, research. Thank you very much. Thank you, Petra. And in one minute, Rosanne. So uh, I was just reading really advocate. So um, in, in summary, um, yes, involvement of all of more men. I think we're all agreed on that, and and perhaps a, a shift towards um, considering innovation, gendered innovation. Um, as we move, um, we move forward. Thanks very much for a very interesting panel. Thank you, and thank you so 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 much to all of you for participating in this uh, in this panel. I think it has been a very uh, good exchange that we have had here. Thank you, Rosanne, Nicoline, Petra, and Titi Lope, unfortunately who couldn't come back, for showing us that there is still a lot to do. Uh, for gender research. There is still needs to inspire the young generation and to stimulate their passion for fighting for equality, for highlighting the contribution of both men and women, for bridging the gender gap in agriculture, and definitely for influencing the policy dialogue on agricultural transformation through a clear gender lens. We really are very happy that we can stimulate these discussions and we really want to see how we can walk the talk. 
as we continue to be involved in this 2021 Cultivating uh, Equality Conference, but even after, let's see where we, we, we will be next year at the same, at, uh, in the other conference that we'll have there. I hope there will be some more progress that we would have made. Over to you, Doreen. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, so for me, it's just to say a big thank you to all our participants who have been uh, engaging with us very actively on the chat. A big thank you to our panelists. Thank you for accepting our invitation and to shedding a light on this um, conversation on the importance of and the potential of gender research. Uh, and to you, Michelle, our moderator, to all the award staff and to the Cultivating Equality Conference team. Thank you so much for your support in getting this done. We just have three minutes before we have exhausted our time. And so just to say a big thank you and to wish you a fruitful um, uh, week ahead and in the rest of your participation in the conference, which is going on until Friday. So Definitely. thank you very much. Mm -hmm. We'll be there up till Friday. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>